Welcome to the Breakfast Leadership Show, where we interview global thought leaders on business, leadership, and life. Here's your host, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and chief burnout officer of the Breakfast Leadership Network, Michael Levitt. Welcome back. I've got Brian Adams on the line. Brian, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Looking forward to uh, talking to you, of course. Yeah, likewise, likewise. And we talked a little bit about the importance of talent so uh, in, in hiring and in, in business. So uh, why don't you share with the audience a little bit about you, your organization, and the awesome work you do. Sure. So I'm Brian Adams. I'm, uh, I'm not a Canadian rock star. I'm uh, the CEO and founder of um, PH Creative, where um, a specialist employer brand agency. So we work in um, UK and Europe, APAC, and uh, I spend most of my time in San Diego in America. That's awesome. And, you know, because you've got the different dynamics of, of working and living in different places, you know, what are some of the dynamics and differences that you see in talent and what are some of the common things we tend to see? So it's interesting that um, typically uh, UK and Europe tend to focus on um, – strategy a lot more um, an HR policy in, in the US uh, the the emphasis seems to be on the the, the technology and so sort of being able to scale and, and do things efficiently but of course the commonality is you know I hate the phrase war for talent but you know every client we, we work with they're looking for the highest caliber of talent they can possibly get um, you know competing against their talent competitors um, you know so a lot of those things are, are, are the same and you know we spend a lot of time uh, educating our clients to think differently rather than just be um, trying to be attractive to the whole audience trying to be confident with who they are so um, in many respects so they can repel more people than they compel to their brand which seems to be Slightly counterintuitive in our in our industry, but we've proven it time and time again. It works. It's a great way to do it too, because if you have everybody wanting to work for you, then it's going to water down, you know, the the products and the services that you're going to be able to produce. You know, just like anything, you know, and with entrepreneurs, you know, they always tell you to niche or niche down, depending on what part of the world you're from. And as an employer, you should do the same thing. It's like this is the type of person or people that we want in our organization to match the culture of what our leader wants us to do, all matched up, of course, with the skill set of being able to accomplish what we need to do. So oftentimes, you see organizations will say, well, I've heard people say, well, we just want a pulse. I'm like, well, I, I'll, I'll, dro- I'll drop off you know, my, my neighborhood cat if you want. There, there's a pulse. Go, go to it. Well, they can't do anything. Well, that's, you, that's all the only thing you asked for was a pulse. There's a pulse. Um, and they like, no, that's not what we, okay. So it's, I, I find time and time again, a lot of organizations really, and, you know, some, like you said, you know, are looking for, we want the best of the best talent. Mm-hmm. And everybody in that sector is also doing the same thing. So how do you guide employers to go, all right, what, what do you need to do differently to really get to the type of people you want in your organization? And again, repel those that uh, you don't. Yeah. So that's a great question, you know, and it's interesting what you say actually, because uh, you're right. I've, I've seen that, that uh, opinion expressed as well. And I think people are the only true competitive advantage left in business. You know, everything else can be automated. You can use AI, you can commoditize things and scale, um, you know, but people are, you know, quite often the, the most um, precious commodity. And what we do is we, we, we simply audit uh, and research what makes each organization different. And usually you will find a culture that um, people are very protective over, you know. So it doesn't make sense, like you say, to let any old person who can who can technically have the competencies to do the job, they need to be a good match or a culture ad, um, you know. But there is a lot of competition out there. And um, what we found, particularly this year, um, you know, the pandemic, civil unrest, people... People want the truth, 
You know, people just want to be communicated with and understand uh, exactly who an organization is and what they have to offer, which goes beyond companies bragging about their strengths, benefits, and opportunities. And what we find is organizations that are confident enough to lean into the harsh realities, the adversities to be found within the employee experience actually have a much more compelling offer because, of course, we all know that things aren't easy. You know, nothing in life worthwhile is um, simple, easy or free. You know, so if we talk about, listen, these are the expectations and demands, the sacrifices and commitments you have to put in to to come and work here. But if you are willing to do that, then here's what you can um, look forward to as well in terms of accomplishment, learning, career progression, and finding purpose, impact, and belonging inside of a company. So all it is really is, you know, it's not rocket science, it's quite straightforward, but it it does involve being vulnerable enough to talk about those things that, you know, as humans trying to put our best foot forward, we're not always programmed to to want to do that, you know, but um, as I say, we've we've tried and tested this, We've, uh, we've been doing it for many years and it works. I'm glad you alluded to the pandemic and some of the changes on some things uh, because, and we I mentioned this, I think in the, in the pre-show, but many organizations have been hiring people uh, during this pandemic and they've never set foot in the office of the organization. You know, the interview and hiring has been through zoom or some other yeah. visual um, component and they've started work. They're, they're doing work, they're getting paid, they're producing, and they've never, you know, physically met people before. And while there's been other, you know, sectors that have done that, you know, freelancers, you know, the fivers of the world where you outsource some things and people do it, you know, that's fine. But in the typical brick and mortar office building type of workplace, mm-hmm. it's it's a new frontier for so many organizations, especially those that have been around for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're adjusting, adapting to all of these things. So, you know, what what are the some of the things that your you know, your clients and the people you've been working with have said that they were it's working well for them, or what are some things that they're still struggling with? I think with this pandemic. Yeah, great question. I mean, the first thing that um, a lot of organizations had very immediate realizations was culture isn't um, uh, free lunches and, um, you know, foosball tables and all of that that stuff that people typically use to attract people to come and work for them. You know, culture is about repeatable behaviors and consistency and things that you can rely on. So, you know, when you have a problem, is it a collaborative environment where people are going to be supportive and empathetic? You know, how, how do people cope with stress and pressure and deadline and work-life balance and, you know, answering all of those fundamental important questions, um, you know, We've, we've actually seen evidence of having more human, genuine, authentic conversations and sharing stories of um, how people have coped inside an organization with, you know, isolation and juggling kids and animals in the background while you're trying to have meetings. You know, we've, we've all been there and, and done it. You know, so what we've found is um, through employee engagement surveys and feedback is those organizations that aren't afraid of the real conversations and work really hard, um, stepping up communication, um, you know, anticipating challenge and putting extra resource in place. You know, there's a lot of evidence to say that culture and, and people have felt like they feel more together, even though, you know, they couldn't be further apart because they haven't physically been in contact with anybody since, since March. It's been an interesting dynamic in the people that you think would thrive in a working a remotely or working from home environment have been struggling. And those you thought, well, they're going to have a tough time of it. They're having the time of their lives. They're like, I'm getting so much more done. And it's, it's still early on in this, but I'm hoping that there will be more studies on you know, why, why does this person have success with this and this one struggles? What are some things that we can figure out, all right, what can we do to harmonize that a little better so people, especially if they're working for an organization that's always going to be virtual, whatever forever means, uh, then they can still be successful because some people you may say, you know, I want to work for whatever tech company that announced we're going to stay virtual. But they're like, but I, I 
I'm going to miss the interaction. What can I do about that? And there's ways to do it. I think once the pandemic eases up and finally is over, mm-hmm. a lot of things that people did when they were working remotely, like they would work in the library or a coffee shop or go to a shared workspace type of thing where they're around other human beings, those things I think will come back. They may look a bit different. We'll see. Uh, but I, I think there's and you you mentioned it, there's there's ways to figure out how to do the interaction, even though you're not necessarily physically in the same room. I mean, you know, I'm I'm in Toronto right now and you're in San Diego. I spend a lot of time in San Diego. If you look behind me, I've got a San Diego coffee mug on the shelf behind me. So <laughs> I love that city. I spend a ton of time there. Well, not so much now because there's this border closing something or another. And it's like, and apparently I'm not essential, so I can't cross the border. So um, I, 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 you know, I mentioned this, like, I guess I'm not essential. Hmm, okay. I'll, I'll keep that in mind when I do things. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, and I, I tell this with people all the time, especially this year has been difficult for a lot of people. It's like, don't focus so much on what we can't do right now. Focus on what we can. Mm-hmm. And as an employer, okay, what can we do to help bring on the top talent in this different way of bringing on talent what what are some things because we can't like you said we can't bring in you know the ping pong table or the fancy coffee machine or anything like that it's like they can't come to the office it, it, the building's closed or we don't have anybody there so you know it's it's just you know thinking outside of the box a little bit and going okay what do people want and yeah. I, I love how you said it's like right now in this world everybody just wants truth you know and just <laughs> be open and share the challenges in and, and being vulnerable too as a leader that's something that a lot of leaders aren't necessarily comfortable with but it's such a strong leadership trait of showing you know okay we're figuring this out too yeah you know? absolutely you know and we've seen we've seen organizations that have had a digital transformation plan um spread over 12 years that have had to bring it forward and do it in six months you know and you know, it's challenged a lot of convention and uh, leaders have had to think differently. And they've also tested some um, some ideas that they didn't think were possible, but out of necessity, they've had to let entire workforces work from home. And, you know, um, some organizations are fearful that, oh, well, if they work from home, they won't, maybe they won't do any work. Well, guess what? Like they do, you know. Um, so I think uh, when we do return to, to some some semblance of uh, normality again, you know, whatever the next normal looks like. I think um, mindset of organizations will change. I think barriers and biases will have been broken. And I think there will be more choice. Um, And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of signals and signs, you know, to, to demonstrate there is, a lot of benefits by to, to giving people more choice and allowing them to get their work done on their own terms. Um, you know, and, and I think apart from, you know, personal and health uh, difficulties and all of that side, and, you know, we, we won't even go into the politics of it. Um, I think a lot of organizations will look back um, and agree that 2020 has been actually very positive and very useful for restructuring and looking at the health of an organization and balancing what's best for people and with the organization. And it doesn't have to be in tension with one another. You know, it's not about, well, you know, do we do the right thing for people or do we do the right thing for our bottom line? Um, Finding where they overlap has been, you know, probably some of the best, most effective strategy that I've seen uh, deployed this this year with, with many an organization, small or large. And one of the things, too, with this, and I've heard a lot of people refer to this as kind of their great reset where organizations can take this opportunity and go, all right, we get to redesign things right now if we like, and that's what we're going to do. And so, some say that what's happening now with the remote work and all of that w- was going to happen eventually. But part of me goes, I mm, it, at this scale, I don't think so. I would. There's a lot of very rigid, been around for a hundred plus years. We've done it this way. This is the way we do it forever and ever kind of thing where those organizations were forced to do it. And, and to your point, when you said people were worried, are they going to do work? Well, not only are people working, they're working on average 20% more than they were before the pandemic because they, they yeah. traded their commute time to just working time. Plus, Many of them are full-time school teachers now and all of the other things that are going on. So the 
eight hour consecutive day now is, yeah, you might get in a few, you know, eight hours of work in a particular day, but it's not going to be in this consistent nine to five type block. It's going to be in, in segments. And again, I think from a workflow standpoint and working with colleagues in your organization and, and synchronizing all of that, I think there's a lot of work yet to be done on that to figure out what works. And the, I think the fluidity and the flexibility of it actually is a positive because organizations can say, you know what, now, and I know for myself, I, I tend to be task oriented in the morning and in the afternoon tends to be more follow-ups, conversations, things like that. So I, I design my days that way. And for a lot of people, they may have, may not have been able to do that before, but now they might be able to, or they see, you know what, from four to seven o'clock every day is perfect for me to work on these things where normally they have to leave work at you know four thirty or five or something like that. And then all of a sudden they're like trying to do it in the morning where the caffeine quite hasn't hit what it was supposed to. So again, th there's a chance that the quality of work is actually going to be improved because people can focus on exactly what they need to be working on. Absolutely. And I think the key is organizations need to embrace the change that's been forced on them, but embrace the learnings that have naturally, you know, um, transpired. And you know, the, there are a lot of there are a lot of benefits. Like you say, if you if you're more pro more productive in the morning, then it makes sense to give somebody the flexibility to organise their own day and, and and be as productive as possible. One of the things we've identified is. Um, not only has productivity gone up, you know, not just because of the commute, but people just don't know when to switch off. They're having difficulty switching off. There's no sort of physical leaving the office. So people are just working longer and they're consciously saying, I have a problem here. I'm working too long, but still they keep doing it, you know, and we've had to consciously remind our own team, look, you need to switch off. You're no good to us if you are burned out or you're overly stressed or, you know, so people, you know, are very mindful, especially if they do have to do the education, the kids in the middle of the day and all the rest of it, you know, there's definitely an element of guilt or should I, I'll just do that one more thing, you know? So, you know, the role of, of HR and, and business leadership really does need to lean into this and be more, um, empathetic and compassionate and flexible, resourceful and creative with how um, you do the right thing by by people. It's um, it's it's not as it's not as easy as people might think. You know, there's a lot of people there working way too hard um, just just because of the change in the environment. Yeah, I'm working at home where for many people they've never done it before this year mm -hmm. ever. So they had, they didn't have any of the equipment. They didn't have set up that it just all the tools access to networks and all of that stuff were all you know brand new thing for so many people and I, I always tell people give yourself a ton of credit for navigating what we've navigated this year absolutely I just really you know be your own cheerleader your whole organization for being able to pivot and do whatever you can do because we, February yeah we had some inclinings something was happening we in different parts of the world we saw some stuff but then you know in the u.s and in canada mid-march hit and then okay everybody's going home and normally we're like woohoo you know let's go it was, it was just before saint patrick's day everybody's like yes but then <laughs> you know all, all the pubs are like sorry we're closed i'm like this is is this a twilight zone episode <laughs> You know, we all can go to the pub, but then they close the pub. It's like, it's like my favorite Twilight Zone episode. It was Burgess Meredith just wanted to have time alone to read his books and all that stuff. And people are always bugging him and all of that kind of stuff. And finally, the end of the world pretty much happens. And he's the only human being left. And he's standing on this big pile of a, a you know, busted up library. And there's books as far as you can see. And he's like thrilled. But then he grabs a book, but his glasses are broken and he can't <laughs> see. And it's like, I, it's the same thing. It's like, we can finally go to the pub and no work and all that. But the pub's closed. It's like, hmm. And, <laughs> and there we've been. That's 2020 in a nutshell. So, but no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, we, you know, I'm not, you know, grab a crystal ball, I guess, kind of thing. And we, it's hard to say what, you know, the next normal is going to look like, but mm -hmm. As you've seen and had a few months of observations of organizations and how so many different types of companies have adjusted accordingly, 
do you see any common themes of what things might look like as a whole for you know a variety of sectors you know going forward once the pandemic is behind us? Yeah, so one of the most interesting things that we've seen is um, obviously we work in employer brand, but when you look at consumer brand reputation, and then you look at organizations like Airbnb, who are very eloquently, compassionately had to let people go, and you know the the, the letter published from the CEO, and then you look at the like bad scooters who um, fired thousands of people via Zoom um, discompassionately. There's a there's a boundary um, merge where people are judging where to spend their consumer dollars based on how well that organization has treated their employees. There's a greater uh, awareness, you know, it's in the sort of general consciousness of of how brands are um, behaving, and I think there's been a, a a quantum shift with a wake up call, if you like, that actually. We need to. We need to do more. We need to. We need to protect our reputation. We need to put our people first because it can affect our bottom line. It can affect the the spending dollars of you know our customer base and the whole host. So, we're definitely seeing a shift of organisations taking people related strategy a lot more seriously to the point where it's like priority number one. You know, even down to. Um, Diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, there's a huge opportunity for organizations to step up their game now and, you know, they can hire people anywhere. Like there's so many more possibilities and and, and options. And there's never been a more socially acceptable time for organizations to be vulnerable, you know, to say, look, you know, here's where we are, but here's where we want to go. And actually right now, what we've seen is that's an incredibly compelling call to arms where the right people would say, I want to join that cause, you know. Um, so, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it a wonderful thing that actually nice guys can finish first? You know, telling the truth and doing right by people is a competitive advantage right now. And I think those organisations that seize the day with that mindset, uh, we're, we're already seeing evidence of you know them them taking leaps and bounds ahead of their competition. And that's a great thing to hear because I think the organizations that take care of their employees will obviously attract employees to go to there. And consumers will go, okay, this is a company that's not only operating from a sustainable standpoint, so they're not trashing the planet, but they're taking really good care of their employees, which means I want to spend my money there compared to the competition that I normally shop at because they historically have not treated their employees well and 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 as those dollars start shifting and as we've seen with social media and things it can happen quickly it's not mm-hmm. like a a trend where okay over a period of few years you know a certain automaker for example started to have declining sales and it you know over a period of time where now everything is so instant that you, know, you can have significant losses in an organization. We've seen it with stock prices. We've seen it, you know, when Uber had their issue and everything yeah. else. It's like it's, it, it it can derail an organization and bring it to its knees yeah. almost instantaneously. So, organizations that are watching this, you know, take care of your people. They'll take care of you and your customers, and uh, the bottom line will definitely be impacted, but in a very positive way. Yeah, absolutely. I guess the only um, <clears throat> the thing I would say to to be mindful of is, you know, these days you've got to do right by your people, but you've got to make sure that you um, curate and own the narrative with employer brand and an employee value proposition that's a clear two way value exchange. So not just what's on offer, but what you want, what you need in exchange for people to thrive, not survive, and um, you know. I'm I'm really pleased to to report that you know the rise in employer brand and the priority of that um, articulating exactly what is the culture and uh, what what you can expect in the employee experience. Organisations are taking that more seriously now, and um, you know the war for talent will rage on. Um, but doing the right thing and um, being open, transparent, and having a 360 message about 
you know, the, the, the good days and the bad days, you know, here's, here's what you can expect. Uh, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, but if you can treat your audience with the, uh, the respect they deserve and give them all of the information they need to make better decisions or to where the, the, their next career move um, should be, then, then everybody wins. You know, if people can find impact, purpose and belonging, then organizations find uh, efficiency, effectiveness, productivity and happy people make happy bottom lines usually. Couldn't agree with you more. So, Brian, I've loved this conversation today. Where can people find out more about you and this awesome work you're doing? So, I've um, released a book in in March called Give and Get Employer Branding. It's available on Amazon, Waterstones, and all good bookstores. Or you can visit ph-creative.com uh, or contact me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with your audience. I'll definitely have that information in the show notes. So, Brian, thank you again for the awesome work you're doing. Continued good health and happy Thanksgiving. You too. Take care now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The The Breakfast Breakfast Leadership Leadership Show, Show. part of The Breakfast Leadership Network. Visit breakfastleadership.com for tips on empowering your business and your life.